This is the second day of the June 97 day retreat at Springwater. For people who haven't been to talks here before, you may already have noticed that talks mostly come from what is being brought up in meetings. Questions that are asked or comments that are made, things we talk over together. Someone challenges what I'm saying, that all goes into a talk in one way or another. And actually, many people have mentioned to me that this is very helpful because it, it is a way in which we participate in what is going on during this retreat which does not mean there is pressure put on people to bring interesting questions to a meeting so that I have material for talk. One needs to bring nothing to a meeting. Maybe something will come up, maybe we'll just sit quietly, pleased to, to feel unpressured. <clears throat> when a question emerges during a talk, it is most certainly not what somebody said verbatim. I can't remember it that way. And also, curiously enough, often many people ask a similar thing during a day or two. So what emerges is a synthesis of different questions. So hearing it worded differently from the way one may have put it does not mean one has not been understood. I hope people don't mind about it their questions being used in this way. Always trying to keep it anonymous. <coughs> One person said, why is it that I can come in here and we can talk about something together in all openness, freedom, looking at something together. And at another time, two people sit down and are at each other's throats. What's the difference? This person asked that. Why can we at times sit together and open something up and look at it in a friendly way, both of us interested in examining something, a problem, And in, in this sitting together and examining something, it can be a real joy, joy of looking, joy of discovering. Two people or more than two people together. And why is it at other times that we're at each other's throats? Antagonistic, aggressive. 
divided. It's in the first case that we mentioned we're not divided from each other. We're both looking at the same thing with a common interest. And as it feels with a common energy, which common inquiry evokes or brings into being. What's the difference, the person asked, and we were looking at that. And then the person said, and maybe it is that in coming here for a meeting, I don't want anything of you. But in the other case where argument develops or starts right from the beginning, is it that we want something of each other? want the other person to agree to what we say, to come over to our position, to be different, to be the way I want you. Is that what brings dissension or friction? Instantly wanting something of another person, whatever that may be. wanting to be regarded in a certain way, to be treated in a certain way, to get something that one has gotten before. Wanting that person to be something for oneself, is that the problem? Wanting something? It's such a profound question, it can remain with us, can't it? So, as there is either this common looking and questioning, or the instant emergence of polarity, antagonism, adversity, wondering what is happening, not just being sucked into that adversity, which has its own satisfactions, amazingly enough. We, we do love to have enemies. There was a TV special once by, I don't know what it was called, anyway. Sam Keen put it together, it was called Why We Love to Have Enemies, was that? I may remember the title wrong. The venting of suppressed, controlled discontent, anger, fear, which hurts being inside, controlled, suppressed, venting it against somebody. And family, society, Religious, national, ideological groups always provide scapegoats. The black sheep. <coughs> so it isn't that we are just afraid of getting into, getting at each other's throats. Human beings seem to love it. To fight. To win. To argue. To hurt, because one has been hurt so much, is that why? We've often talked about it, the, this reservoir of revenge that builds up, builds up already in little children, trying to pay back what one has had to swallow or put up with. Do it to someone else, maybe someone weaker, 
one doesn't need to be afraid of. One can't do it to the strong, or the, the older brother, or the father, or mother, or teacher. The satisfaction of power, which comes with aggression. Does this sound in talking, when I'm talking, does, does it sound as though I was blaming, finding fault or judging? Or are we looking at something together by listening to the words and also looking within <clears throat> whether what is said is so? By looking within, using the aid of memory. What? how we live, how we have lived, what happened yesterday or five years ago, may, may surface as something like this is said. A meeting together in hostility or a meeting together with common looking. In which animosity is not there because we're both interested in the same thing. Not to prove a point that we already have, but to find out. Or the, like the person put it, getting together and instantly being at each other's throats. There's no need to condemn because what we do to each other, the hurt, the pain, the suffering, the sorrow speaks for itself, doesn't it? It doesn't need to be condemned. It speaks for itself, cries out. And why do we do it? Not we shouldn't do it. We should become better people. People. That's not the point. Why? To, to watch it. One person asked in a meeting, this question, really, I'm on fire with it. What, what does it mean to be a human being? She didn't say what does it mean to be a man or a woman or an American, or a white person, or a Buddhist, or a Christian, but a human being, which we all are. And she continued asking, do we have to live the way we live? It's not condemnation, it's questioning, wondering. And, when, and a question like that grips one, then there will be awareness and attention to watch, to observe, to learn as we go. Not just about the other folks out there, but ourselves. In relationship with each other, what triggers us off? How we sound when we say something. I remember the first time somebody here was on the building project told me that I had yelled at her. I was dumbfounded. I didn't realize I had yelled. Because maybe the word yelling may mean different things for different people. But there was something in what I had said. I hadn't been angry. I didn't think I was. Yet she said, you yelled at me. Can we begin to hear how we sound? So it is possible to perceive not only what we want, but how we sound to someone else. How that must feel, the way we just came on. Is that asking too much of us? We'll find out. We'll, put, we'll pose the question.
Because someone asked, why is it at times we can sit together and inquire with great friendship and at other times at each other's throats? What's the difference? The whole thing of wanting came up in the opening talk already. What, what is wanting? And usually what the mind is occupied with throughout the day and night is the objects of wanting. What it is one wants for oneself from other people. Wanting to be loved, to be taken care of, to be appreciated, to be admired. Wanting lots of money or position. Wanting a family, wanting children. Wanting a husband or wife or wanting a different husband or a different wife. Wanting children when one doesn't have them and wanting to be without the kids when one has them. Our desires change all the time and there are so many of them, the objects of desire, that they're also in conflict with each other. We want to be good and yet there's such stored up anger, violence in us, which wants out, wants to find a target, wants to be expressed, wanting to get along with people and yet wanting power over people, wanting power over oneself. Control, it's brought up, been brought up in several meetings by several people. This incessant wanting to control one's life and with that, the lives of others. So, there is an endless, endless amount of wanting going on throughout the day and night. And the mind is occupied with these objects of wanting. We, we were asking more than that. We were not just asking what do we want, but what is wanting itself. The whole restless, mental, organismic movement of wanting within a human being. Because that is partly what it is like to be a human being. It is wanting. And maybe as one begins to examine wanting, alone and together, examine, it doesn't mean intellectually, meaning to be in the presence of it without division, to feel it, to feel it churning. The, the churning meaning that the body mobilized to get what the mind has projected as a wanted goal, a wanted thing, a wanted person. The, the imagination of that, one, the imagination of oneself having that or being that, and this imagination of oneself with the goal, the person, the money, the situation, getting the body mobilized to get it, to go for it. So, in, in wondering about it and coming upon the state of mobilization, can there be a feeling of that rather than just being 
totally absor absorbed in the imagination of what it is one wants. To see the whole thing, is that possible, we're asking? To be in touch, intimate with it? Maybe realizing directly by looking, inquiring, that wrapped up in wanting is fear. <clears throat> fear of not having, fear of loneliness, fear of what we think is our inferiority, our insufficiency. Fear of not being somebody or not being as good as somebody else. Again, endless fears, fear of this, fear of that, fear of losing one's job, one's lover. Fear of being rejected. That's wrapped up in wanting. It's in there. Implicitly or explicitly. And also wrapped up in this wanting package. This mobilized body is the potential at any time for, for anger and violence if we don't get what we want. if our wanting lines are being crossed, foiled, frustrated. We're not condemning that. We're just looking. We're putting something out for general inspection. I'm looking too. I'm not lecturing from a book. Memory is in there. It, it, it can be accessed, but there's looking going on. Looking what has been observed in oneself and in relationship with each other. And in, in other people. If one watches other people without wanting something of them. Just an open kind of watching, without condemnation. Because with all of this, the question suggests itself, doesn't it, whether it is possible that the mind and body be without wanting. The body has needs for food, for air, for cooling or heating, for exercise, procreation. There are deeply inbuilt needs which have operated for hundreds of thousands of years through all throughout evolution. One can observe need getting coupled with wanting at a time when the, the, the blood sugar is low, has what we call hunger feelings, feeling of hunger. And what instantly happens, if one is aware of it, one may be so engrossed in a job that one is not aware of being hungry. We're not talking about that, we're talking about some kind of dim whatever uh, state of awareness it is hunger 
low blood sugar. And then the mind projecting food. Usually not just drab food, a crust of bread, depending on the bread, of course. <laughs> but something delicious, spread out, to pick from. Or if he, he may be sitting in some of the fragrances from the kitchen are wafting into the sitting room, imagining a plate full of this stuff, loading it up. And at a, at a moment like that, can one see the difference between imagination, and of course the imagination feeds the hunger pangs in a non-nutritional way. It increases it, it, it fuels them. Or wondering whether it's possible at the moment of noticing that to just be with whatever is going on in this organism without the imagination supplying a menu. And I'm, we're not saying that's wrong. It's just an interesting experiment to remain with what we call hunger and wonder what that is and realizing one has rarely, if ever, done that. Usually it's the combination of the need with the imagination of how to fulfill that need. And, of course, the imagination and becoming the, the powerful thing, and the, the thing that there is attachment to. The imagined food, or if it's, uh, of course, imagining being with another person, a very beautiful woman or man. And the effect of imagination on the body. And the question whether one can remain with what is happening in the body without fueling it through image and fantasy. And then when there is, when the time is there to eat, there is the food on the table. How does one eat? What is, what is eating? Is it just eating, chewing, smelling, the, the fragrance of it on the palate, the swallowing? Where, where is the imagination? Where is the mind? Where are the thoughts? Are they already out in the kitchen to with the seconds that one hopes one will still get. We're not condemning this. We're looking at what goes on in us. And whether it is going on, maybe it isn't going on, but one can't tell, one has to watch, one has to look. Is it possible to remain with one spoonful of tofu rice and mushrooms with some soy sauce on? completely with that for the whole duration of it? Or is the mind already with the next spoonful? Or with this insatiable want for more? Which is not something to be condemned but wondered about. It may originate early in our childhood when we didn't get enough. When there was competition. Remember during the war, tremendous competition for small rations. And, and I out that everybody got the same. I'm still dividing up and dividing up food. So very careful that everybody gets the same amount of grapes and cherries. So. Yeah. Our programming starts early for all these things. And it continues unabated unless something sets in which says, wait a minute, what is going on? Let me look. Awaking up to all of our programs and fantasy programs and physical, which, which run day in and day out 
on their own, automatically, autonomously, mechanically. The whole thing can be very interesting to, to bring a new awareness to what has been unaware, s s uh, automatic, all our life. And with a new awareness, a new life comes into a moment of, of doing, of eating, or swallowing, or listening. Hearing oneself talk, listening to someone else, listening to wanting, which runs human life amok most of the time because of all the conflicts in wanting. And it's not a question of what we're going to do about it, but can we see it? Can there be some light shed on all of that? And maybe that's the doing. Maybe out of that will come something new, something different. Something that is seen clearly, directly, without prejudice, without fear, no matter what it is, greed or anger. To see it, to look at it, to be with it, to find out about it. We, talk, we were talking about it this morning, someone, about anger. Looking at anger. Often in talks such as this, we have talked about being with anger, with all the symptoms ravage this body, that pervade every cell of the body. Constriction in the throat, the blood rushing to the head, muscles tightening, all the, the power of adrenaline, narrowing of the channels of seeing and hearing. All of this can be paid attention to. Maybe not at the moment of anger, maybe at that moment there is a, a lostness in it. It's so pervasive. But anger, as many people, maybe everyone knows, can be evoked just by thinking of what made me angry again. There it is. Almost as powerful. And here, while sitting, why not look at it and see what's going on? What was just described and also We've often talked about it, but we'll, we'll talk about it freshly. The, the headlines that go on. I shouldn't be angry. I mustn't be angry. Or I have a right to be angry. I'm justified in this anger. I must express it. I shouldn't express it. All this conflicting stuff that the computer throws out, commands and instructions, which don't jive with each other, conflict with each other, contradict each other, and more anger or confusion on the basis of that. And with these, what I've called headlines, don't be angry or go ahead and be angry, no, no real directness with the anger. What is it? These instructions prevent a direct intimacy with this thing we call anger. Even the word anger prevents a direct intimacy. One has to put everything aside and look what's going on. Listen. In the midst of it, a listening, without judgment. Is that possible? Someone says, yes, it's possible, but we have to find out for ourselves. We can't eat someone else's food. And 
in connection with that, this morning we also said, why not inquire about why we get angry? One can just get into a system of, I've got to be with what's there, and I mustn't think. The person actually asked at the end, is this legitimate to do? See how, how we feel. I, there are certain things I should do and other things maybe are wrong, meditatively speaking. Why, why do we get angry? I want to know if I get angry, why I get angry. Which means I have to evoke the specter and go through it. And see what, what part do I play in this? My wishes, my, my desires. Because somebody could say, well, why blame yourself? We always blame ourselves, we've learned that. Why not see what the other person did? Well, see the whole thing. What the other person did, what I did, it's the same thing, really. Tomorrow the roles will be reversed. Maybe the next moment. So as we said earlier, is involved in anger the desire that has been blocked or foiled, my way has been crossed. I wanted something and I couldn't get it. Are we lucky? I wanted to be somebody and I didn't get the recognition. Not only I didn't get the recognition, but someone insulted me, hurt my feelings, and the anger, and fear. They're so sometimes not disentangleable. <laughs> Can't disentangle them. Fear and anger so closely wedded. Why do I get angry? Why do I get hurt? What, what in this structure of me, all the images and ideas about myself and the wants, what gets hurt? What gets offended? What gets frustrated? What I imagine to get, to be, to have? And with that, this instant mobilization to some kind of violence, verbal or physical, or suppressed altogether, it arises, but the habit has been since early childhood to suppress it all, because if one didn't suppress it, one was not a member of the family. One had to go to one's room, leave supper. Mother did not smile happily upon one. It's very, very hard for parents to be in the presence of an angry child, or a sad child, a crying child. Very trying. I think we talked about it, either in meeting or here. Because with the anger in a child is evoked all the anger of our own childhood, which probably was not expressed, or if expressed was punished or frowned upon, and which slowly or quickly was learned to keep under control. And now this uncontrollable angry child very hard to be with. Doesn't know how to deal with it. Well, of course, wants to control it. So we've all come up in very similar ways, a little bit different here or there. Some parents may have been less upset over anger than others, maybe more upset over something else. And aside from parents, it's sort of programmed into us to mobilize energy to get what we want, to survive, to get the food, to get the mate. Programs of adrenaline and whatever, hormones, to, to go for it. And if that is impeded by any kind of obstacles, there's more 
a glandular activity to leap over or crash through those obstacles. which happens in things that have nothing to do with survival anymore, physical survival. They have to do with the survival of the idea of myself, the feeling of what I am, and want to maintain. Permanently. Some people say, you talk a lot about inquiring and questioning, but at times when I sit there isn't a, isn't a question in the mind. There's nothing to inquire about. Nothing rumbling. Nothing. Then should I question? There's no should. It's not a system that one plugs into here. Even though people tell me you do have a system. Maybe I do. Incidentally, when I mention it, when people challenge me, it doesn't mean that there's a battlefield going on. One person asks, is there a battlefield? I just like to bring up things that were asked which are challenging. It's good to be challenged. Very healthy for all of us. So, there's nothing one should do, but when there's no question, when everything is clear, does that happen? Everything clear, no feeling of division, no one there, then what is there to be questioned? But if the question comes up, should I question something, where does that come from? There's a question. Do I feel I should be perfect? The first question leads to the next, and one doesn't have to answer them all. Just wonder about all of our programs that surface at times, all the time. Wanting. Wanting to be right, to be good, not to be wrong, to be perfect. At times, questioning doesn't mean a verbal question, which is pursued. It just means, I don't know. Sitting and not knowing. And the senses awake and open and not divide it from each other. Does the thought come up, I want to, f to, to be like that? Then let's look at wanting this moment without judgment, freely. Openly, is that possible? And not exclude the, the, the calls of the birds and the cool air, the traffic sounds, the heartbeat, the breathing, it's all there. Maybe a little bit faster when there's a lot of wanting. I mean the heartbeat.
We will end here for today.